Hey guys, today's video is going to be divided into two parts. This first part, I'm going to be answering two comments that were left on my channel, and the second part, I'm going to quickly debunk a Flat Earth video. If you want to skip to the second part, click this annotation to go there directly. Anyway, let's get started. This first comment comes from Apple Pie XOX. Could you maybe make a video on why planes can fly when the Earth is not flat? Could you just explain how planes can fly when the Earth is moving so fast? It is one of the things my brother and me talk about and I'm not a science person, only a nurse, so if you could help me understand. Because I have been looking too and did not find anything. Thank you, you are most kind. Well, thank you for asking the question. First, I would like to say that you are a science person. You're a nurse, you're an expert in your field, that's awesome. Everyone who goes into science can't possibly know everything about science. People who are experts in biology will naturally not be well informed in physics, or even other fields of biology for that matter. Myself, for example, I'm pretty terrible in higher level physics, but that's okay since my area of expertise is on biology. It's the same for you, but that doesn't mean you're not a science person. Anyway, to answer your question, the answer is fairly simple. Some people may think that logically if you're so high in the air, the Earth's rotation may mess up your flight. I'm not sure exactly how your brother is saying how the rotation of the earth affects the plane, but this is what a lot of people get confused about. Let's say you're flying against the rotation of the earth. In that case, you're going extremely fast since the earth is rotating against you. Meanwhile, if you're flying with the rotation of the earth, you can't catch up because the earth is rotating so fast. But in reality, it's not like that. Everything comes down to relativity. Think of it this way. If you're on a train that's moving 200 kilometers per hour and it's moving at a constant speed, will you have difficulty walking to the front or to the back of the train? The answer is no, right? Walking to the front or back of the train feels the same as any regular walking routine you've ever done. And this is the same for the Earth. The Earth is spinning. Everything on the Earth is spinning with it. The air and the plane is part of the Earth. And just like on a train, you're not going to feel the rotation of the Earth as long as the Earth maintains a constant rotation speed. And by you, I mean the plane. The plane won't feel the rotation of the Earth. When the plane is in the air, it rotates with the Earth. Any movement that does from there only travels the plane a distance relative to the Earth. I hope that answers your question. If I misunderstood or didn't give you the answer you were looking for, just feel free to ask me again. Anyway, let's move on to our second comment. This one comes from Shelly. Hey Stick, I would love to see a video on your take of the spotlight sun. Based on some stuff I read on Flat Earthers, they all say the sun is like a spotlight, plus they like to use the term how we actually experience it. In that case, since I have never seen a spotlight without some shell at the back or around the edge to prevent the light from illuminating all around it, does that mean a spotlight sun has a shell around it that causes the distinction of day and night as we experience it? Thanks, Shelly, for your question. Here's the thing. When flat earthers say spotlight sun, they don't actually mean that there's a shell in the back of it, although that's what it sounds like. They're saying that the sun's illumination is like a spotlight and only lights up a local area. A shell on the back of the sun would be pretty ridiculous and contradictory to all observations we have. If there really were a shell, we would be able to see it pretty easily. This also wouldn't answer the question how we can't see the sun during the night. Even if it's local illumination, we should still be able to see the sun during the night with the technology we have. But we can't because there's a whole earth between us and the sun. Even if there is a shell, the problem still remains. So yeah, on the flat earth model, the sun is extremely small and extremely close. They say that the sun just illuminates a small area. I've already pointed out a few flaws in my previous videos about the flat earth. I've even had one dedicated to talking about the sun, so if you haven't seen that yet, be sure to check it out. In conclusion, they don't claim there's a shell around the back of the sun. Even if they did, it would be pretty ridiculous, but their local illumination of the earth is also a flawed idea. Sure, they've used it to explain certain phenomena such as seasons, but there are still so many problems they can't explain with the model. In addition, they always claim to say what the sun or earth actually is, but they don't ever explain how that happened. Like, what are the forces that hold the sun up and give its path in the sky? What's the flat earth suspended on? How did this universe of flatness come to existence? It's just all talk without any real science. There's no numbers, there's no calculations, no equations, nothing. If the flat earth is so obvious, certainly you can come up with some equations to explain the pattern of the flat earth, but there's nothing. Anyway, I hope I answered your question. Let me know if there's something you would like me to clarify. And now, on to the second part of this video where I get to debunk a video. And that's coming up right after this. Hey guys, so I got a short video to debunk, and of course it's on a flat earther. Here's someone who's presenting an argument I've actually never heard before, so let's get right into it. 
how far away is the sun? Okay, so this is what I did. If the sun is 93 million miles away, says NASA, and all of the scientists, and also Wikipedia, and all the science websites, then we should be able to totally figure that shit out. Oh my god, you are making it very hard for me to edit this right now with all those quick cuts. We have figured the distance out. How do you think we got 93 million miles? You think that one day NASA just said 93 million miles, and then suddenly all the scientists in the world were all like, yeah, 93 million miles. That's ridiculous. It's too big of a conspiracy to hide. So that's what I set out to do. Equilateral triangles means all the three sides are the same length and the three angles are all the same as well. You're cutting your video so fucking fast that you're even cutting yourself off mid-word. 60 degrees and the three sides are the same. So anytime you have a triangle that has 60 degrees in one corner and 60 degrees in the other corner, then you know that the third corner is 60 degrees as well because angles have to add up to 180 because that's how triangles work. So basically she's explaining something extremely basic and is only making one real argument in this video. There's not much for me to say until the very end, so I'm just gonna play the clip and respond to it all together at the end. I'll do my best to cut down the irrelevant parts for you guys. But then you also know that then the three lengths are the same. And then you measure the length between those two points where you've measured the 60 degree angle. Then you know that the distance between the two people down here is going to be the same as the distance between the peoples and the sun. If the sun is 93 million miles away, then you'd have to have one person. That person would measure from the horizon to the sun at a 60 degree angle. If the distance between the sun and I is 93 million miles, then the other person facing me, and they are also measuring the sun at 60 degrees from their horizon, they would should be 93 million miles away. And then that makes the triangle work. But this is where everything chaos, because it is super hot in my room, so I had my fan running. I didn't, I forgot to turn it off for the video. Yeah, yeah, um, I don't care. I chose Macapá in Brazil, and then I looked on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean, Equatorial Guinea. There's this city also on the equator. It's just been in math. And then, oh, oh. I discovered that when it's 10 08 a.m. in Macapá, Brazil, the sun is at a 60 degree angle from the horizon for our friend looking towards Africa. And then at that same time, around 2 08 p.m., uh, for the person standing in Malabo, Africa, looking towards the west, they're seeing the sun at that 60 degree angle from the horizon because of the time zones. That's the same moment. And then <laughs> we have two people facing each other, 60 degree angle, the sun. Then we can figure out the distance between these two people tells us the difference between each of those people and the sun. And so it turns out it's not actually 93 million miles. I wrote it down. 4,138 roughly miles. What does this mean? This means that the sun is not 93 million miles away. No, first of all, you're assuming that the Earth is flat before you even began this. On a globe Earth, our horizons in different areas aren't the same. You physically cannot form an equilateral triangle if you're using the horizon as a reference to where the angle starts. On a globe Earth, you'd have to go through the Earth and have that length be one of the sides of the triangle. Second of all, there's atmospheric refraction. Have you done the calculations for that? The sun isn't in the position that we see it is. The atmosphere does all sorts of refracting that would prevent us from seeing the real position of the sun with the naked eye. Sure, the site you use to see the angle of the sun may have taken this into consideration, but I'm mentioning this now because it'll be important for later. Third of all, if you think these angles matter so much, I'd like to see you explain how the sun sets below the earth on a flat earth model. Please, I would love to hear it. Now, this isn't the part of the video I really want to debunk. Here's what I'm really interested in. If it was on a globe, then you'd have something like this, where the person in Macapá, Brazil is standing, looking at the sun at a 60 degree angle from the horizon. And then the person in Malabo is doing the same thing, facing each other. Well, the problem with this model is that the sun 
this not converging into one point the way we had down here is actually diverging. So the further the sun is from the earth, the more impossible this model becomes. Oh, you think you got it all figured out, don't you? The biggest problem with your drawn model here is that you're assuming the sun is small and you drew it extremely close to the earth. In reality, the sun is huge. Why are you drawing it so tiny? And it's extremely far away. The further and bigger it is, the more vague the angles become. You can't just measure 60 degrees and say that's the absolute position of the sun. First of all, like I mentioned earlier, there is atmospheric refraction that occurs. Second, since the sun is so big and far, you can't possibly take an accurate measurement like this. I mean, you can, but when you're going to the next step and using it to disprove the ball earth, you better show your calculations. One vague drawing of the earth and a tiny sun isn't going to prove anything. Imagine this, the earth is that tiny speck you see on the left and the sun is on the right. Look at the size and distance. Now, you're probably wondering how we know the sun is 93 million miles away. Let me tell you a story first. The first attempts that were made to measure the sun's distance from the earth was also by the angle and naked eye observations like you're doing now. At the time, we knew the distance of the earth to the moon. So Aristarchus, a Greek astronomer, waited until a time when the moon was half illuminated, indicating that the angle between the moon in respect to the sun and the earth was 90 degrees. He then used this estimation to determine the sun's distance. The problem with this is that he used his observations to estimate, which ultimately gave him the wrong answer. Kind of like what you're doing. Now, continuing on with the story, it was only until later when we more accurately measured the sun's distance, and we did this with Venus. In short, when you observe Venus very carefully at a specific time, you can watch it pass over certain parts of the sun. After timing this pathing, we can then determine the distance between the Earth and Venus, and then ultimately the Earth and the sun. Now, this isn't the only method we have that says the sun is 93 million miles away. We have other methods too. For example, we have used parallaxes with Mars to determine roughly the same distance. Yes, we do use angles all the time when it comes to measuring the distances of stars and planets. However, we never use two angles from the same source. We never use two angles we obtain from Earth because that's highly unreliable. Wait, correction. We never use two angles from Earth at the same time. We can use angles from Earth after we know that the Earth has traveled a certain distance, but we will never take two angles from Earth at the same time. That is where your little drawing goes wrong. Sorry, but reality doesn't work the way you think it does. And I hope you will think about stuff like this more before you go boasting about it on the internet. 